Okay, hi everybody. Uh, we have uh, Yadid Hoshen today here. Uh, he recently completed his PhD at the Un uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor Shmuel Peleg. And uh, he's going to join uh, Facebook AI research as a postdoc research. His talk today is end-to-end uh, -end learning, application in speech, vision, and cognition. So, uh, thank you very for the introduction. Um, so, my talk today is going to be about end-to-end um, -end learning. Um, I think that end-to-end -end learning is one of the more interesting applications of, of deep learning. And basically I'm going to talk about examples of end-to-end -end learning that we, we encountered over the last year of my, my PhD. Um, and this is going to be across multiple senses, across both uh, vision and, and hearing, um, and also even like, for, the, for the full uh, perception and cognition action cycle. Um, so this is based on three papers. Um, so we start from uh, talking about speech recognition from multi-microphone uh, raw waveforms, uh, basically uh, being able to do automatic speech recognition directly uh, from the waveforms, the microphone signals themselves, um, as opposed to some other representation. Um, then we, we discuss um, a novel application, um, an egocentric look at video photographer identity, basically uh, being able to recognize uh, the photographer of an egocentric video. Um, and that's something that at least some people thought um, that might not be possible. Um, and then we discuss um, a new task uh, for end-to-end -end learning, uh, visual learning of arithmetic operations, basically being able to do um, to, to learn arithmetic just from pictures, as opposed to some other symbolic form of learning. Okay, so we start from uh, speech recognition. So this work was done as a part of um, a Google internship, and it was done um, in Google New York uh, with my collaborators. Uh, Ron Weiss and Kevin Wilson. So, automatic speech recognition um, basically means being able to uh, recognize speech automatically, um, and more specifically, the main task in automatic speech recognition is speech to text. So, taking a speech waveform um, as shown in the figure and transcribing that into a sentence. So, that's that's the main task. Um, so. At least up to a couple of months ago, um, most state-of-the-art systems uh, broke this task into two, um, acoustic modeling and language modeling. Um, acoustic modeling means basically taking this uh, log utterance and breaking it into short, possibly overlapping clips, and then classifying for each one of those clips um, the most likely trifold. So a triphone is, a phoneme is the smallest unit of speech, and R, bar, these would all be phonemes, and the triphone would be a sequence of three phonemes. For example, in the word president, reside would be um, a triphone. And the reason why we care about triphones and not phonemes is that triphones give us context. Phonemes sound very different in different positions in the sentence, but triphones um, are a little bit more invariant. Um, so this is the first task. Basically, for each one of those short clips, when I say short, I mean um, they could be 20, 250 milliseconds, but they would be very strongly overlapping. So you would move them once in every, say, 10 milliseconds. Um, and then taking these triphone probabilities, um, we, we enter the next, next task of language modeling. So infer, inferring the most likely sentence out of all of these triphone probabilities. Um, so, in this work, we only deal with acoustic modeling. We don't do anything to do with language modeling. Um, Google's got very good out-of-the-box uh, language models, so we don't talk about that. Um, so let's concentrate on acoustic models. Um, so what most approaches uh, previous to this work did is they, um, they basically took these short clips of, of speech um, they, they extracted features, and we're going to talk about these features uh, in a little bit. Um, and then they uh, used a deep classifier. Uh, back then, the most common one was a fully connected neural net. Um, 
to try to estimate um, the trifon uh, probabilities, the trifons that exist in a, a short clip of speech. Um, so basically the question that we ask is, do we really need that feature extraction stage? Um, we know that in computer vision there's no need for that. So do we actually need to do it in automatic speech recognition? Um, so uh, not to keep you in suspense, the answer is that it is probably not necessary. Um, and this is really the first method to successfully use convolutional neural nets, uh, a raw waveforms for large scale automatic speech recognition. Um, okay, so to really understand, um, maybe to understand what people did before, and um, I usually find it helpful when I design new architectures, um, to try to understand um, what previous approaches did without neural nets uh, to motivate uh, the neural net architecture that I'm going to design. Um, so we're going to describe a specific pipeline that does get state-of-the-art results in automatic speech recognition, uh, the gametone filter bank pipeline. So this is a handcrafted pipeline. It took uh, decades of research to, to finalize. Um, and it's, it's quite an interesting thing. So the gametone family of filters um, is a, an interesting family of filters. Uh, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, I think one of, the, I mean, one of the most interesting reasons is that it's at least partially auditory motivated. So uh, the, hu the human ear has uh, some mechanisms that have responses similar to gametone filters. Um, but in, in more practical settings, um, it's interesting because um, it gets state of the art results. But in terms of what it actually does, um, it has a set of band pass filters. Um, where each one of these uh, bands increase as a function of frequency on a number of scale. So this is called uh, a bell filter. Um, so on the uh, right, uh, on the right hand, sorry, on the left hand side, we can see the actual filters. There are time delay filters. So um, so we can see how um, the, the responses change, how the uh, the bandwidth uh, increase. Um, but if you really want to understand what's going on, let's take a look at the frequency response plot. And we can see that um, the, these are band pass filters, obviously, very narrow range of frequency. And the, uh, the, band, the band width increases as a function of frequency. Um, so that's the gamma tone family. And so the first stage of the pipeline is to take each one of these utterances and to convolve them with this gamma tone filter band in the time domain. So that's the first stage, we get 40 uh, filter responses. So the next stage is framing. Um, basically taking, uh, breaking the, each one of those filter responses into uh, short, let's say 25 millisecond overlapping frames, overlapping by 15 milliseconds each. Um, and then each one of these frames, uh, we take the filter response, um, we, we sum it, um, and this gets us the spectrogram, so it's a response square that's um, And then the last stage is passing it through a log of nonlinearity. <coughs> um, the human ear is sensitive uh, to sound on a logarithmic scale, um, and it's also been found to improve performance, so uh, typically these spectrograms also pass through a log of nonlinearity. Um, so that's the handcrafted uh, pipeline that people have used before in automatic speech recognition. So our first observation is that this gametone filter bank is, um, or at least can be modeled by a very, very simple convolutional neural net. Um, so let's take a look again. This gametone filter, uh, the first stage, uh, getting those gametone responses, uh, can be modeled just by having a simple convolutional layer. Um, the convolutions can be learned to have gametone filters, we can learn other things. So it's only a special case of what the convolutional uh, layer can actually model. Um, so framing is not equivalent, but is similar to pooling. It's not quite the same as average pooling because we actually get the, uh, the square of the response, not the response itself. So it's not exactly the same as pooling. Um, and then the log nonlinearity um, can't actually be easily modeled using uh, using neural architectures because. Uh, we typically use values, which are too linear for uh, logarithmic functions. So we actually had to implement a log nonlinearity there. Um, log, can 
relied on what? On the signals, on the output of the filters, or on the Fourier transform? On the on, on, on the responses of so we take the frames, we do some sort of summing on that, mm -hmm. um, and we take a log of this. So um, obviously, so typically it would be the square of, of the responses. So it's always it would always be net positive. Um, in our case, because we use value activations, again we guarantee to have uh, positive output. We also add a small constant just to make sure we never get zeros. Um, so it, it's quite safe. Is this um, log layer at the, the end of the neural network or after each convolution? So we only have a single convolution. I, I showed the complete architecture later, uh, but it's at the end of, basically after the value activations, we also put a log. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so, right, so the first observation was that mm -hmm. this feature extraction pipeline is basically one convolutional layer, one pooling layer, um, and custom nonlinearity, and that's the <coughs> logic. Um, I should stress that this layer doesn't have to learn gamma tone filters, it can learn whatever it wants, but uh, we'll show what it actually does. Um, okay, so the team I was in, in Google, um, was only partially interested in doing automatic speech recognition for clean data. Uh, the main objective was actually doing automatic speech recognition uh, for noisy data. Uh, the main application was doing automatic speech recognition inside uh, vehicles um, or inside living rooms. So, in these particular scenarios, uh, the microphone is actually quite far away from the speaker's mouth. Um, and that, that causes quite a lot of difficulty um, because the SNR is lower. Um, so, low SNR means that, um, it, first of all, the reason is that, first of all, the distance is larger, so SNR is lower. And also, there's a lot of very non random noises, which makes it quite difficult to do noise. And there's um, reverberation because now there's many more paths between the um, between the mouth and the microphone, um, so we get quite a lot of echoes. So all of these things um, make the problem um, in these settings, which are very practical settings, uh, quite a lot more challenging. Um, and when clean automatic speech recognition can give us like maybe six percent word error rate, uh, for these types of problems we can get maybe more than twenty percent word error rate. Like we're not there yet. Um, so one common solution that people use is using multiple microphones. Multiple microphones can do uh, something called beamforming, um, which um, which is able to do directional noise filtering. So if we take a look at the figure um, at the um, at the bottom, we can see that um, this two microphone system is um, is sensitive, that emphasizes signals coming from the top, um, but signals coming from the bottom are suppressed. Um, so let's try to understand um, why this happens. Um, so uh, this is important because we'll show that the same convolutional layer can also do the informal. Um, so so let's take a look at the figure on top. Uh, so we have three um, microphone system, and we have signals, we have speech or some other signal coming either from the top or from the bottom. Um, so for the signal coming from the top, uh, the wavefront arrive, arrives first at the um, at the first microphone, at the top microphone, and arrives later at the bottom microphone. So by adjusting, by introducing artificial time delays inside our system, um, we can make all these wavefronts arrive at the same time. And so when we sum them up, we'll get constructive interference. So the signal would be emphasized. Um, on the other hand, if the speech were to come from a different direction, then all the time delays would be different. For example, the wavefront would arrive first at the bottom microphone. And so, um, by adding the same time delays as we had before, um, all the wavefronts will not arrive at the same time, so we would not be getting this constructive interference. So effectively, we would be suppressing the noise coming from specific directions. So this is, in a nutshell, how linear beamforming works. Um, and so what we argue is that this same convolutional layer that we had before can also do beamforming. And so why... Please. And that means that you train on the same setup in which you will be recording the actual speech. The setup of the microphones and my position in front of them should remain the same. Um, so that's one experimental scenario that we examined, but there's other experimental, uh, experimental scenarios that we've also examined that have been quite a lot of follow-up works on that. 
um, is actually having speech coming from a lot of different directions. Obviously, the neural net might have to learn multiple uh, time delays, but you know, it can do that. Um, so, but, but for people who weren't quite as quick to, to understand what the network was doing, um, so basically, um, what this convolution, this convolutional layer is fully connected, um, is fully connected in the space of the microphones, and so we basically um, the, the network is able to learn uh, the same filter for each one of these microphones with a slight a slight time delay uh, between the two two filters that the network learn. And so effectively, uh, the network, um, apart from doing the feature extraction stage, can also do beam forming. And again, this is pretty much the simplest architecture that we could come up with. I, I didn't understand that. The architecture. It's like a one neural network for the microphone array. It's the same, or is, is it all? The ratio of one for all delay, for all microphone, or one for all? After the whole. After the whole. One for all. Um, so this is really the first method to do end-to-end -end, uh, beamforming for automatic speech recognition. Um, basically, because we work from the time domain, we can do that. Um, okay, so that's that's the architecture. If you're wondering what it actually looks like, um, so we have uh, multiple microphones coming in. Um, we actually just took two. We also did experiments with more, but the results are pretty much the same. So we didn't put them in the paper. Um, so we have um, the two ch speed channels coming in from the two microphones. Um, so the first layer is a convolutional layer um, with a um, set number of filters. Uh, we used 40 or 80 for the multiple microphone case, but we can choose whatever you want. We just want it to be consistent with the uh, handcrafted features. 40 is kind of a golden number in automatic <coughs> recognition. Um, so First of all, we, so we have these convolution layers, uh, then we have a max point layer um, that keep, uh, each one of those kernels is 25 milliseconds and there's uh, 10 millisecond steps. So it's pretty much analogous to the, uh, to the framing operations. Now, keep in mind that we are doing max pooling, we're not doing average pooling. Um, it's not exactly the same as a framing operation. Um, we have some ideas for why max pooling, it, it does work better than other types of pooling. We have some ideas why this might be, but we have no proof for that. Um, so then the next step is this custom log nonlinearity. Um, keep in mind that all the outputs of the uh, we have a value activation in between, so uh, there's no negative numbers, um, so the log doesn't blow up. Um, and then we have uh, full, the fully connected classifier. Back then, that was the state of the speech, I mean, four or eight fully connected layers. Uh, these days, you would usually use an LST. Um, and so the output is a softmax layer with 14,000 outputs corresponding to the number of trifolds. Um, so I should stress everything is being trained end to end. We're not, you know, first of all, training the fully connected classifier and then the rest. Um, everything is trained end to end. So the delays are implicitly learned as part of the fully connected They are being implicitly yeah. learned. We don't pre specify. In the fully connected part of the no, 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 in the, the, the filters, in the beginning. Okay, right. Actually, if you mention that the bias is caught, or it's a physics, the bias is caught, but it's not able to change, right? Because it happens after, after the scheme. After the bias, after the scheme, it happens. It's the same thing that happens in the microphone. It's the same thing that happens in the microphone. It's the same thing that happens in the microphone. It's the same thing that happens in the microphone. Did you program all this in TensorFlow? No, that was before TensorFlow. We didn't have TensorFlow. So that was it perfect? No, no. In Google they had a custom built language. Uh, inside Google Brain that everyone used. It was similar to TensorFlow in the fact that it was fairly low level, but it wasn't TensorFlow, it was something else. Or at least it didn't have this name. I don't know if they used some of the stack. Uh, but I, I did change some of the code of that, um, that software stack, but I don't know if that's now inside TensorFlow. Um, you need to you need say about something about the filter, how, how good or how similar are 
to the... Yeah, we'll, we'll show that. Slide. That's a result. Um, but it's a great question because it brings me into uh, the section exactly. Um, so let's take a look at the results. Uh, first of all, let's look at the single channel filters. So on the left hand side, we can see the handcrafted features um, in the frequency domain. They're obviously time, they're, they're actually in the time domain of filters themselves, but it makes a lot more sense to look at the, uh, the frequency responses. Um, so on the right hand side, we can see the frequency responses of the filters learned by our network. Um, in, in the center, we, we have uh, the filters of the network when it's initialized with gamma tunnel filters, and on the right hand side, we can see the filters when initialized with random weights. Uh, we'll show quantitative results afterwards. Um, so, um, I, I guess I, I would like to point out that um, the filters are not exactly the same, but some of the behaviors uh, seem similar. We have sorted them by set of frequency. Um, they don't come out sort of naturally because there's no reason to. They have a fully connected layer afterwards, which doesn't care about the order. Uh, so we, we sort of them uh, ourselves. Um, so some interesting things that, that we see are that at least some of them are band limited, not all of them, but many of them are band limited. Um, and also it's interesting to see how the bandwidth does increase as a function of frequency. Um, so at least what people handcrafted uh, seems to make sense, or uh, at least the network seems to be doing uh, similar looking things. Um, so let's take a look at um, the kind of features that our network is able to learn. Um, so obviously our network is learning the features, but if we take a look um, at the architecture, um, basically the output of the log nonlinearity um, is, um, is analogous to the um, handcrafted, handcrafted features. So basically by looking at the handcrafted features and the learned features, um, we can maybe see some of the differences um, between the net, between the, uh, the methodologies. Um, so if we take a look, um, on the top, uh, these are the handcrafted spectrograms. At the bottom, uh, these are the brainograms, so the, um, the features learned by the rural brain. Um, and so the, these ones actually look fairly similar. Um, it has been pointed out that the brainogram features look sharper than the, the spectrograms, but um, they look quite similar. Um, it gets more interesting for the two-channel uh, brainogram. Um, so basically, at least the way it's been done um, in, in the neural net literature is basically for multiple channels, people just stacked um, the, the features together and put that as the input to the network. Um, but because we work in the time domain and we can combine them together, um, we, we can basically do, do be informing. Um, and so if we take a look at the brainogram features, they're actually quite a lot cleaner. You can see over here, for example, um, it has the noise, at least some of the noise, in the, um, the, original, in the original features. Doesn't it use bad? Because it seems awfully clean it's, uh, between the, in the noise in the bacterial shake. זה נראה ממש, הפעלתם על זה איזה שהוא בית, או שזה איזה איזה כאילו הכנסתם על רשת בעצם? כן, זה נכון. אנחנו בעצם משתמשים את זה, אז זה אחרי זה יש כאן אינפלסט אינפורמט, אז זה כל כך קורה בפנים. אפשר להגיד שזה כאילו זה 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 כאילו So that, that's a possibility, although follow-up work has shown that um, with slightly modified architectures, um, this kind of implicit end-to-end -end beamforming does better than at least some of those beamforming methods. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the, um, the filters actually learned uh, by, by the network. Um, so on the right-hand side, we can see the time domain responses. Um, so at least some of them look fairly gamma tone, but is also very qualitative. Um, if you really want to understand what's, and, and we can see some time delays between these somewhat similar filters, learned from the two channels. So it's doing pretty much what we hypothesized. Um, if we really want to understand what's going on, let's take a look at the, the right hand side. Let's concentrate at the, uh, the filter on top. Um, so what this plot shows is um, on the x axis, this is the frequency, 
the y-axis is direction, and the intensity is the um, strength of the response. So, first of all, we can see that uh, this filter is very much a band pass filter, although so there might be some higher harmonics. Um, but if we look closer, um, we can see that um, some directions of speech coming in are actually suppressed, actually speech coming from 90 degrees. And this is quite interesting, I'm oh, sorry, signal coming from 90 degrees. And it's quite interesting because uh, that was actually the direction of the speech. Um, and what we hypothesize is happening, although again, we have no way of, or at least we don't know how to, uh, to verify this, um, is that it's doing some sort of noise estimation. So it's basically estimating the magnitude of the noise in this band part, in, in this band, and then it's also learning um, another band, uh, sort of the same band without this um, noise cancellation step, and, and then it also it knows the whole signal and also the noise. It's getting some sort of noise. Um, but this is speculative. Uh, we at least didn't know of a good way of uh, seeing that that's what the network is actually doing. Um, so in terms of a quantitative comparison, um, so for the single channel case, we did somewhat worse than the handcrafted features. But um, in, in follow-up work where they've changed the architecture um, to um, an architecture called um, SCLDNN, so convolution, convolution is basically our step, LSDN, um, so a recurrent neural network, and then a DNN on top, um, they, they get better results than the handcrafted features like to like. Um, what does it mean in the error? Just recognizing a different triplet? No, this is word error rate. Um, that in, in speech, the way to, uh, to evaluate the systems is actually the whole end-to-end -end performance of the system, not a frame estimation error. Or, or what you mentioned is the frame estimation error. That's what you actually train on, but you don't evaluate on that because it's quite easy to gain those statistics. Um, and it doesn't really correlate, or doesn't always correlate with the thing that you actually care about, which is why it right. So you use the complete system, including the language model and so on, although you don't optimize any of that. Um, so um, for the two channel case, we did better than the hard part of the features, because our system could, because it worked in the time domain, it could implicitly do uh, informing, and so we did better than the, uh, the other system. Um, so, just to conclude this part of the talk, um, so acoustic models can be learned end-to-end -end using convolutional neural nets. Um, that seems quite apparent. Um, raw waveform inputs can improve multi-channel automatic speech recognition, as shown in this work, and follow-up work has shown that it also improves results even for uh, a single microphone. Um, very little manual design is required, although we did give quite a bit of motivation why we chose this specific architecture. It's actually a very simple architecture and could have been uh, other people's initial guess. Um, so it seems like, although many decades of research were performed, um, neural nets could do it in a much shorter period of time, even during a summer internship. Um, and the features learned resemble auditory features. Um, that could or could not teach us something about uh, the way the auditory system developed, um, but this is speculative. Um, at least it is showing that some of the research done is optimal, or the network thinks it's optimal. Is there any reason why you choose uh, four fully connected layers? No. Uh, we chose four fully connected layers because at least in Google this was like the standard small network that you use. Uh, the large network that was had eight fully connected layers, and that, I mean, that they did experiments with the, uh, the eight layers. Two also each one of the layers, I think they used four times as large. Um, it just took, instead of you know, taking two days to train, it took a week and a half to train, so it, it's not great for doing research. Uh, pretty much all the results that worked for, for those four, four layers also worked for the eight layers, except that the numbers were quite a bit better for the eight layers. Um, so it, it's a good thing to research on, but actually for, for if you wanted to deploy it, uh, you might want to use the larger than that. Um, these days people would just use LSDMs, so none of this would... LSDM is what? LSDM, yeah. a long short uh, term memory network, it's some sort of recurrent neural net. Mm -hmm. um, LSDM. LSDM, and yeah, that's what people would use. Um, but again, everything follows, and LSDM, when you have these convolutional filters and attach them to an LSDM, it learns very similar filters, and pretty much everything follows. 
Okay, um, so enough speech. Um, 